to be or not to be? That is the question. For more than 400 years, the role of Hamlet has beguiled and obsessed the greatest actors. Murder! The latest to take up this challenge is Benedict Cumberbatch. Have you any idea how much weight you lose no, when you're doing this? No, but I have to eat. <laughs> you go to hell on the lick, don't you? No, there's a lot of running. There's a lot yeah. of... Uh... Such is his profile that Cumberbatch is drawing new audiences to the play from his legion of fans across the world. And Lindsay Turner's production is the fastest selling show in London theatre history. I met Benedict Cumberbatch on stage, mid-run at the Barbican Theatre, and asked him about playing Hamlet. Max Beerbohm wrote that uh, Hamlet is a role, a hoop, through which every eminent actor sooner or later has to jump. What made you jump now? Kind of makes me sound like a, a circus performer. Uh, <laughs> I suppose there is an element to that. It, what made me jump now? Uh, age, life experience, most importantly. Um, the opportunity to bring a new audience to a 400-year-old piece of brilliance and um, to try and make Shakespeare as relevant now as he uh, has ever been since then. And I've just become a father, and I used to think that I'd have to be childless to be a Hamlet, and I thought, well, maybe that's going to be a difficult ingredient to play with. It's, it's miraculous, though, as, as I'm sure you know, being a dad, that you're, you're, you're thinking about how you were parented shoots up as well, so that's all fed into it. So that was serendipity, though. That wasn't as planned as this was. <laughs> but there is a feeling, I don't think necessarily Mini Hoop is a, is a sort of circus thing, more mm. as there is this Beecher's Brook. It's coming at you, this enormous fence. Yeah. And, it's a and, huge and a lot wave of the, uh, and were, most yeah. of the great actors have said, well, I'm going to have to do this. Yeah. Deep breath, well... I, I, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe one day. I mean, I've seen some truly extraordinary Hamlets in my time. Stephen Delane, Simon Russell Beale, Mark Rylance, Rory Kinnear, and Sam West, to name a few. So I thought, oh, is there a sort of biological clock ticking for an actor <laughs> to do this by a certain time? If you hadn't done Hamlet, would you have felt that you'd missed the greatest challenge, that you'd maybe even ducked the greatest challenge? Very possibly. Having now done it, very possibly. I mean, I... I never, I did never start out with the bucket list of great roles that I wanted to play. I mean, of course, it's something. I found that a lot of other people coming up to me with the idea of it was a sort of more of a constant voice outside of my head than in my own head, going, "You should give this a go." But having 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 done it, I, I completely understand now why people, sort of a year and a half ago, when I said I was going to do it, were like, "Oh, you're doing it! Oh, good luck!" It's huge. It's just huge. At almost 1,500 lines, Hamlet is the biggest role in Shakespeare. When the story begins, Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, has married his uncle, Claudius, only two months after his real father's death. An emotionally confused Hamlet has reluctantly returned to the Danish court to join the wedding celebrations. The first big scene was sitting next to the yeah, yeah. <laughs> massive table. I, I thought it was a very good... A very good idea, that the great stage, and, and the, it, the, the the dinner table became a court. Hamlet is all very much in that, not dressed like, not part of. Now, what did that, what did that decision about your place on that table lead to? The positioning of where we are on this table is very much to do with seeing the youth of the court together. You have Ophelia, you have Laertes, and you have Hamlet, and their trajectories through the play are towards death. This, this is very much um, a look at the play through the eyes of the idea of transgenerational trauma. So why do all the youth of the play end up dead, as well as some others, but primarily the youth seem to suffer an incredible amount at the hands of the, other, the, the generation above them. Before his death, Hamlet's father had been engaged in a long and bloody war with neighbouring Norway. After atrocities on both sides, Claudius, now the king, is trying to negotiate a peace. But it's the emotional effects of the war that form the backdrop to this production. Transgenerational trauma or transgenerational idea has been brought up by 
and by the director and by yeah. yourself. Can you just unpack it a little? What it means to you? There's this new whitewash that's come with Claudius. He's a brilliant king, Claudius. He's fantastic. You know, he's got everything sorted. He's, he's, he's dealing with what would have been a war in old Hamlet's time. And that's part of the trans trauma that seeps back into this place. It's definitely what my father did. But it's not right. There's a great deal of unrest that still hasn't been dealt with. Everything is reduced into this sort of rigid state of it's going to be all right. And there's one person at the beginning going, no, it's already absolutely screwed. But now, our cousin Hamlet and our son. A little more than kin and less than kind. There are odds from their first exchange. Yeah. They're Claudius and Hamlet. The first words he speaks are, um, you know, a little more than kin and less than kind. I'm more than your cousin and I'm a lot less than your son. And I try very hard not to be churlish with that. I'm talking to a king and I'm in a court, but at the same time, I can't, I can't let that go. And the next needle in my heart that he cannot ignore is Gertrude saying, why seems this so particular with thee? Why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam, nay, it is, I know not seems. It is not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor the windy suspiration of foresaid breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shows of grief that can denote me truly. There's nothing seeming about this at all. This is who I am. This is who I feel. I'm your dead husband's son, and I'm grieving him because it's less than a, two months ago that he was buried. But one of the things is that Shakespeare makes incredible power out of what he doesn't say. But for example, Gertrude never says, what a man your father was. Do you realize, oh, I'd like to tell you what a man your real father... She never says that. Well, there, well you know, and then, and, then uh, I think that's the great... Th and that's that's the subtext of the... Pl hugely yeah. powerful, yeah. because what was that marriage? Yes. Was she, as in our production, y much younger, and therefore probably, you know, a courtly arranged marriage? Not to say they didn't have a conjugal relationship, but that it was something that... That, that Claudius gives her now, which is, which is the flaming youth that I, I accuse her of being lost in. And I wonder how much maybe the previous marriage was, was one of convenience, which really complicates the grief, complicates my loyalty to my father and my understanding of what parenting relationships are. But you're right, the beauty of it is that she never says, yeah. no, he, he, he was an extraordinary man. <laughs> Maybe in her eyes, he wasn't. He but I think he lays that on you as well, Shakespeare. Yeah. You're, 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 you're questioning it. You're sort of saying, come on. Please look at what he was and what yes. you're with now. And she's and not I... giving you that. I pray thee stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, it is a loving and a fair reply. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Thaw and resolve itself into a dew. The soliloquies seem to me, this is just my opinion, as the centre and the glory of the play, this, this play by a genius about a genius. The first soliloquy for me, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt yeah. Thor and resolve itself into a dew, is wishing himself to be absent from a world that he feels is utterly devoid of meaning, of understanding, of humanity. It's almost a parallel world he's creating, isn't it? Yeah. Is it as much doing that as talking to an audience, talking to and about himself. Sometimes it's a bit like a conversation with different synapses in his brain, not to necessarily individual members of an audience, but, but to see them as um, parts of the process of his thought. What is it like coming up to, to be or not to be when you know that it, they're the best known lines in world theater and people are chanting the first two or three lines of that speech in their, in their inner minds? Uh, and you oh, have they, to come I'll never to be able to say it again now that I'm... <laughs> But you have to come to One, it as if it's two, fresh. Three. <laughs> to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind. To suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. 
or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing any. But well, you have it. to come to it as if you're thinking it for the first time. But that is it. I mean, that's, that's the trick of any acting in a present moment, I think, is to... It's to find the need. Mm. It's to find the need to say it. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. What do you think Shakespeare gains by not putting that in, let us say, a conversation with a friend? I think the main thing is you get a huge amount of empathy. You have, you have more listening and more involvement with one man's point of view than you do in any of the other plays. And I think that is the romance with him. You at least do get to understand a man. And these confessions are so stark and naked. And so elegant, but many people who describe the way people think mm. have just tried to make it look and sound rather incoherent, disconnected. But this is the most elegantly turned, formulated, thought through, you can go... But, pro, but I think he argues in poetry. with himself, though. Yes, I think, he, does, I think yes. he takes his own arguments apart. I mean, to be or not to be is a, is a fantastic example. You're set up there with the antitheses. You know, you've got, you've got existence and non-existence, and he talks the problem through. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly dour with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment. In this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. of the ghost of Hamlet's father is the first significant turning point in the play. He reveals that he was poisoned by his own brother, Hamlet's stepfather, Claudius, and urges him to avenge this murder. The appearance of the ghost is key. Mm -hmm. how, did you, uh, how did you feel about the way you approached that? A ghost in the 21st century? Yeah, yeah. Were you yeah, worried about course. that? Of course I was. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about the kind of bells and whistles of holograms and things like that, but then... Because I'm not, you see, like, can I, while you're thinking, can I on. just jump in? I think there are still ghosts. They're just inside our heads. I mean, we're full Anyone of ghosts. We're full of people who are dead. Yeah. And I'm not talking about anything, oh, I am in touch with... None of that at all. It's just that our minds are full of ghosts. The full ideas of ghosts of parents and, and, and lovers and friends. And so the idea of there being other presences yeah. in our minds is, is what is part of our minds. Well, for a play that's about memory, about yeah, the past, exactly. about grief, about death, it, it's, it makes complete sense that there is a manifestation of that. Know thou, noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, mine uncle. Aye, <sighs> that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wits, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there. The potency of how present a raw and recent absence can be, that just because somebody in flesh and blood isn't, isn't there, you can still smell them in clothes, you can hear them in music, in 
sensory perceptions you have of the world that are still very real. It's the fabric of what makes us alive now is what's come before us. And to ignore that is, is the danger which I was talking about with transgenerational Absolutely, to do the two most powerful things we have, which are memory and imagination. Yeah. Shakespeare objectifies that. You know, in the past, the ghost has come out of Hamlet's, um, I think recently Michael Sheen, and in the past, Jonathan Price and Richard Eyre's groundbreaking production at the Royal Court. And I completely understand that sentiment because he carries every accusation through you. Whither wilt thou leave me? <laughs> Speak. I'll go no further. Speak. I'm bound to hear. <laughs> so art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear? <laughs> what? I am my father's spirit. Doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But what do you think these foul crimes mm. that he refers to are? Done in his days of nature? Well, I th war. War. Yeah. You know, the, ma the man goes to sleep in his orchard because he is physically, emotionally and spiritually utterly corrupted by what he's experienced of life in death, in war. So he goes to his orchard, uh, my custom, um, always of an afternoon. And I don't think he sleeps much. I think he sits there staring at the sun through the trees. Claudius waited for a bit of time, I think, before he crept in there with the vial. I just, yeah. it's, it's, you know, I think, I think but a, a man isn't going to be to as tortured as, as that ghost is in his, um, in his limbo between whatever it is, how, well, the hell, it's in, he's in hell. Well, it speaks directly to what people are discovering about post-battle trauma, and, uh, I, I th which is I now so. be deeply explored. I yeah, think I so. think so. And I think the people that do witness it, interestingly, are all of one generation. Yeah. And that's the only, again, the sort of grist to our mill of this idea of transgenerational trauma. It's skipped one generation. He's not haunting Claudius. But what, He's not haunting Gertrude. He, he's haunting someone who he feels can... It, through, through telling, through confessing, can then take action on those perpetrators. Having been told by the ghost to avenge his father's murder, Hamlet makes his friends, who have also witnessed the ghost's appearance, swear that they won't speak of what they've seen. Rest, perturbed spirit, and swear besides, however so strange or odd I bear myself, as I, perchance hereafter, shall think it meet to put an antic disposition on. And then there's this extraordinary notion that uh, Hamlet puts on his antic disposition. Yeah. Now, where do you think that came from? The play is extraordinary with madness. Hamlet's antic disposition is an interesting thing. My personal feeling is that, you know, there's, there's one very specific encounter with death in the shape of Yorick's skull. Yorick was a court jester that he remembers very fondly, who had the kind of free pass to point out the foibles and idiocies of um, those in power. And I think comedians and clowns within Shakespeare, that's, that's, a, that's a very strong tradition, whether it's the fool in Leo. And I think having experienced that as a youth, he realizes that he can retreat behind that mask of seeming um, zaniness and just slowly disrupt the court. Uh, what do you read, my lord? Words. Words. What is the matter, my lord? Between whom, sir? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Oh, slanders, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. All of which I most powerfully and potently do believe, yet I do not hold it honesty to have it thus set down. For you, sir. Could grow as old as I am, if like a crab you could go backwards. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. What is he teasing out? Because he's up to something, taking on the martial yeah. aspect, yeah. the war aspect, yeah. which you take on yes. in your antic disposition. There's well, a great deal very to much do so, that. because it's a country that's weaponizing. Yeah. It's going to overdrive, you know, it's making the night joint labor with the day. It's this big show of power, basically. Mm. And Hamlet sees that by infantilizing it, 
by creating something that is derogatory, which is this toy soldier thing, this idea of making all the potency of you know, a nation flexing its military might, all that kind of macho tension, it, it's ridiculing it. It's mocking it, isn't it? Mocking it, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. He, he's au he's okay fait with acting, he knows what that is. Yeah. He's au okay fait with the craft of it and the skill of it, and he's also au okay fait with clowning and the brilliance of how a fool can navigate those in power and needle truths into them without it ever coming back on them. Masters, you are welcome! Welcome all! <laughs> After the ghost has told Hamlet to kill his father's murderer, Hamlet begins to unsettle the household by feigning madness. A troop of actors arrives to entertain the court, and Hamlet asks the leading actor to recite a favourite passage from a play. This is revelatory to Hamlet. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? Is it not monstrous? This player here, that's in uh, fiction, a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his whole conceit that from her working all his visage won, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, indeed his whole form suiting with functions to his conceit, and all for nothing. When the players come in, yes. Shakespeare says the most remarkable things about fiction and about art. Yes. About the way imagination, you can, I think you perhaps can make soul, the word soul analogous with imagination. Uh, absolutely. You can. can turn reality into a fiction in order, really to make, in order to make it real. Which is exactly so what the audience... Our brains can do it as yeah. well, which is even more extraordinary. We yes. can see a real person in novels and so on. We think, oh, it's based on X, but it isn't X, and yet it convinces me like X would. And he says that, you know, the... But in a fiction, a dream of passion could force his soul into convincing us that he is like that, although it isn't him. Yeah. That's 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 the most. Uh, and you want to for Hamlet wants to force his soul, doesn't he? He what, yeah, because he's what he's seen in the craft of this actor is an ability to express a truth. Yes. It stops him in his tracks, and he realizes, oh no no no, just because I'm doing what an actor does doesn't mean I've changed my uncle. I have to do something to change him, to, to, to see whether this is perceptible, and then I will do it. I will do it because I'm fed up of who I am. It's not about the world anymore. And that's the big change, I think, with yeah. oh, what a, It begins, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. It's the first moment he turns his thought on him. It's the first time we've heard him say, this is on me. And then he berates himself, winds himself up, and says, no, that's not good enough. It's not good enough to fly around in a rage. I have to do something, think, think. And the idea is there for him. And it is this, this, this weaponization of theater. Mm. It's to present a parable, a parallel universe to his uncle and see what his reaction is. By natural magic and dire property, on wholesome life, usurp immediately. Villain, villain, smiling, damn it, villain. That a promise is him in the garden for his estate. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of the old man's wife. The king rises. What? Frighted with false fire? How fares my lord? Give all the play. Give me some light. Away. Away. With not this sir, and a forest of feathers, get me a cry and a fellowship of players. Half a ship. Come, music, some music, come. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Hast thou forgotten? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen. Your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then I'll set those to you that can't Come, come and sit you down, you shall not budge. <laughs> You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. The scene with Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, is, uh, has been interpreted in different ways by different actors. Um, and it's a, it's a scene where Hamlet bursts out of almost all constraints. You go not. What? You shall not budge till I set you up a glass wherein you may see the inmost part of you. Thou will not murder me! Help! 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 How now, all right? Help me! What hast thou done? 
I know not. Is it the king? Oh. Oh. What a ra rash and bloody deed is this? Uh. Oh. Uh. I think that is when he reaches the, 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 the pitch of his madness in the play. I think that's when that whole evening cascades into a place where there are no limits anymore. This conversation has to happen, even though I have the blood of a courtier on my hand. I'm going to tell you about what you have done wrong. She tries to put him down immediately. She does, straight she? away, no, and very yeah. much in the bit. What have I done that thou dast wag thy tongue? Absolutely. You know he's so rude against me. Oh, I get full queen there. That's yeah, the full really... courtly queen, and it's, it's, it's slightly terrifying. But what he holds on to is, yep, no, yeah, but you are still my mother, and you are also your, your husband's brother's wife. You are a widow to my father, yeah. and I've got to speak to you as that person. What have I done? That thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act as blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, makes marriage vows as false as dice as oath. When she's, when she's pleading with me to stop, yeah. and she's saying that words are like daggers in my ear, no more, sweet Hamlet, um, she knows then. I've awoken some realization in her that there was a dignity and a love and a beauty and an elegance to what they had, which this new marriage, not least because of what I'm accusing my uncle of in her face, um, it just doesn't have. It's tainted, it's corrupt, and it's, it's, it's wrong. And he, and as a comparison, he is not a patch on my father. His need from her is to try and get to her on side. He takes every single argument, every single argument back to Gertrude that the ghost gives him about Claudius's guilt, about him not being uh, worthy of her love. He really needs her to understand that, that Claudius is corrupt. And, and, start... I think, and he does talk about that. He says, a murderer, a villain. You know, I, lady, um, twas my word after he's just, he said, you know, a bloody deed, almost as bad good mother as kill a king and marry with his brother. That's a massive accusation. What he's got through to is saying the unsayable, which was yeah. part of the drive of the production. Yeah. And, and now something is he's broken through, and he can do that. It's about making her face her own yeah. actions and taking responsibility for them, and she does. And by the end of the scene, you have a, a, a son and a, a, a mother in complicity. And that wonderful line about ulcerous, the film. Yeah. Oh, it's just amazing. A little bit film and skin, the skin ulcerous skin place skin. whilst rank yeah. corruption mining all within infects unseen. How does he do it? Describing how disease works. If it's extraordinary. It. Disease is rife in this play because yeah. Shakespeare, he would be living with death and ill health all the time, whether it was in his company or people he knew. And he writes about that and its manifestations beautifully. And he writes about you know, the troubles of the soul, but really visceral, real, earthy, directly relatable, sensory perceptions of what our reality is, as well as the more pietic and extrapolated church or god oriented thinking is. You know, his methodologies are beautiful in their abstractions, but there's real directness because he was a man of his world, yeah. utterly. For love of grace, lay not a flattering unction unto your soul, that not your trespass, but my madness speaks. It will but film and skin the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. He is an authentic, tragic hero who is himself a man of genius. And once Shakespeare had written him, he never wrote a man of any genius at all again. Orson Welles said that this was a play by a genius, about a genius, and it was the only play about a genius that the genius ever wrote. I can see why he said that. I mean, I'm, I've been watching Hamlet for ne ne 50, over 50 years now. So many of you have done, found something different in it. Oh, I think everybody has a Hamlet in them. Mm. Um, and as Maxine Peek has proven, you know, it, it's, not, it's not trapped in a gender yeah. thing either. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times. And now in my imagination, how aboard it is. My gorge rises at it. <laughs> there is a universality to the challenge of him that means that, you, you know, any, it, it, it's a role that fits any actor. To be or not to be, 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 that is the question.
We're in East Ham at Langdon Academy and I'm here to watch some drama students do their interpretation of Hamlet. 400 years after this extraordinary piece of writing is still being investigated, does it resonate with kids, with young adults who are growing up in a very different world to 400 years ago? Okay, cool. Are you ready to show me? We'll show you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. East Hamlet. Claudius. Gertrude. Laertes. Ophelia. Horatio. beautiful. It's amazing to see it being done communally as well and see everything descend upon one person to see that manifested by having people as the words crowding in on you. I've got, I've got lots of questions I want to ask you. Do you want to, should we all sit down so it's more comfortable? What was the idea behind every character saying that? I mean, we were meant to be his, the whispers that are going into his head. I see, I see, I see. Is there one emotion that you, you feel strongly when you, when you hear that speech? Maybe um, anger, because um, he's really frustrated yeah. about everything that's going on with him, that he wants to take his life, but he's really, um, it's difficult to make the decision. Yes, what, do you, I mean, what, what do you think when you're, when you're doing the, the play? I'm not sure if this is an emotion, but confusion. Yeah. Yeah, because he's still at the point, should I, t should I take my life or not? Should I take my life or not? He's yeah. confused because of the surroundings. Yeah. He doesn't know if his mom is telling the truth or, or lying, yeah. if his girlfriend's telling the truth or lying, or if his best friend's telling the truth or lying. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's at that point where he doesn't know what's happening around yeah. him. Yeah, and, and he doesn't even know in his own mind yeah. what to do about he's it. A, he's moment. isolated in a corner in his room. Yeah, yeah. Hamlet is in this world where he's expected to be certain things and a certain type of person and he feels as if because he's not that person he isn't in his own body like he feels yeah. like separate kind of like, from himself in yeah, a way. yeah almost like a ghost like the ghost that he yeah. sees my feeling is that I feel sorry for him because he's come to a point where he wants to kill himself and that uh, he's lost people like we can relate to that uh, we've lost people and we know that how that feels and like uh, He's by himself, isn't it? Bless you. Thank you. Brilliant. Round of applause for Benedict and yourself. Oh. I thought it was, it was really, really brilliant. It kind of proves a point to an extent that this play tackles things that are universal. The death of a parent dealing with a new family, madness, and that makes it incredibly accessible. Yes, it's Elizabethan language, but my God, you know, you, 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 you need a bit of imagination and some energy, and it, the thing comes alive to whoever you're presenting it in front of. The play moves to its climax. Hamlet is deported to England by his stepfather, Claudius, who's also secretly arranged for him to be executed. However, through a mixture of good fortune and stealth, Hamlet returns home to Denmark, determined at last to avenge his father. Second half of the play, we have a sort of mutilated landscape. Armies, devastation, wars and rumors of wars are going on there. And Hamlet has changed. He's had this sort of profound experience where through about, you know, 16 coincidences going his way, he's managed to navigate himself out of his custody, realise that he's being sailed to his death in England, 
forged a note whereby the people sending him to his death are sent to their death. Then some pirates turn up and he's managed to grapple into their ship and having been taken away from that boat, become their prisoner, but treated royally because he is royal and obviously there's obviously some kind of economy there. We, we don't get the full discussion, but they're going to be served a good turn. But that's the thing that just makes you smile and smile again about Shakespeare. We have this great and with this amazing philosophical play at the very least of it. And then pirates turn up. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And, uh, just when you think, yeah. You know. Well, there you go. <laughs> Throw in some pirates. And it's terrific. But I wonder what, I mean, you know, I, I, oh, if I had a time machine, I'd love to ask him, I said, when you wrote him off to England, did you ever think, crap, how do I get him back? What, I mean, <laughs> it's just this slingshot of fate with pirates. That'll do it. That'll sail him back. I mean, you know, it's, it's easy, easy to mock, and it's not, it's not trying. I'm not mocking, a, I'm delighted. I it is delightful, though. That's lovely, the thing. I think some people do sort of raise their eyebrows a bit at it or, or frown, but I, I, th I just think it's remarkable the level of playful invention involved yeah. in that. He, he then sets back naked on the kingdom. To me, it's naked in his intent. Yeah. He's coming straight for Claudius like an arrow, because not only does he have his father's death to motivate him, he now has a direct order for his own execution to motivate him. And it's incredibly modern. This is a network of kings who are basically, you know, palming people off on one another in the form of, you know, extraordinary rendition. It's incidents we've had recently in our, in our culture with terrorism. And in a sense, Hamlet does threaten to terrorise the state with his actions in a court. He's killed a courtier and is upsetting the balance of power before he's shipped off to England to be dispatched. I think basically what's happened in all of that is he's, he's looked into the distance in a philosophical way and seen some, he has seen a part of death himself. And that, that shifts him into somebody who feels that he can take charge of his fate. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. I do not know why yet I live to say this things to do since I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Considering the, the fact that Shakespeare is said to have invented more than 2,000 words and brought into use 2,000 words that were not used before and had, for a single person, the biggest vocabulary that any other writer that we know of has had, his constant use of monosyllable is, is wonderful. Even I in simile, you know, I've yeah. just come across a sentence here, I do not know why yet I live to say these things to do, since I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. But you see already the rhythm makes such clear, clear yeah. sense of that. It's, yeah. cl it's, cl it's about clarity of communication, yes. and I think when he really wants to have words weighted, they are, they are often shorter. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. That's a moment of great self-laceration. It's the last soliloquy, it's the last time we hear Hamlet's thought process as an audience, the last time we're privileged to it. And he's in a position where he's going, I cannot believe that I am still yeah. trapped in fate rather than taking control of things, basically. And it's about determining his own trajectory at that point. And I think you hear those words just go bang, 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 because they are monosyllables, because they are so tight and exact. In the play's climax, Hamlet embraces his destiny and returns to the Danish court, where Claudius has organized a fencing match between him and Laertes, whose father was killed and sister driven insane by Hamlet. Come, Hamlet! Come. And take this hand from me. Claudius has conspired with the vengeful laities to poison the tip of the foil, ensuring that Hamlet will die. He submits to it because, for my money, he feels no, but whatever is going to happen was always going to happen. I think he knows it's not necessarily going to be a death match, but if you've come back, fought with someone whose sister and father you've killed, who's then been set up by a king that you want to kill, who you know has killed the king, your father, to a fencing match. So, come on! Something's up. Ah, nothing neither way! Come back to no! 
After the end, the death which Shakespeare brings to a close so rapidly and the speed, it's like farce. I mean, yeah. I'd like the best of farce. The almost epitaph is when he says to Horatio, tell my story. Yeah. Tell my story. Why does he want to say that? He knows he's on the last few words of his life. And the most important thing, the most important thing is for him to tell the truth of what has happened in this court, because otherwise anybody could come in and impose a spin on it. Yeah. He's suffered under Claudius doing that for the whole of the play. So it's so important to have Horatio as the, as the, the audience, the narrator, the witness, the storyteller, to carry that legacy forward. Otherwise, what has it all been for? What a waste. He's still saying, no, no, it, this is to be retold. This has to be retold. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of extraordinary. And then that's what we're doing every night as storytellers, I guess. And that's, that's the beauty of it, you know. It, it's, it's, it's an incredibly important responsibility to tell stories, and Horatio is loaded with the mother load of stories. <laughs> that beautiful symmetry of the first friend he sees and yeah. the last friend he sees. Yeah. I've ever loved it's hold me in my heart, absent thee from felicity a while. And in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain. To tell my story. Oh, I, I die, Horatio. The rest is silence. When you finish the performance, what, what do you feel? You hungry. and then you've stopped. I feel, you, I feel tired and hungry. Yeah, I know you're tired. <laughs> OK, so that's the answer. That's I what I feel. I'll still ask the question, OK? <laughs> Taking your bow, and you've, mm. you've, for a while anyway, Hamlet is diminishing as yeah. your, yourself. But what, what deposit is there with you a bit what has happened in the previous three hours or so oh that's a really good question can you can you ask me after three hours of it tonight and i'll tell you <laughs> i'll tell you it's very hard because you know so much of this is is a moment by moment process it really is um you can't afford really to look to look back or worry forward and when you do do that you become very unstable uh in this role and that's not a dodge to the question because i know what you're sort of talking about that this idea of what what hovers what what keeps what vibrating and, and yeah. remaining yeah D dying on stage every night it, it it's uh yeah you do have some odd thoughts in that moment you really do have odd thoughts as an actor as a technician as someone who's got to do it again the next night is to immediately start to sort of self-critiquing I mean, of course there's a relief, of course there's a... Whew, there's, an out, there's an out breath, there's just an out breath. To put it really simply, there's just... That's it. That's it for tonight. But you said but at the very beginning me, of this, of this conversation that you were quickly. bringing a whole new generation. Mind you, they didn't fill the place, but they were substantially there in a way they are not substantially there for things like this. That must be terrific. Yeah, and it's, it's really thrilling to think it might be getting to a new audience. It is getting to a new audience. That's a terrific thing, and that does stay with me. Mm. And then I drop it all very, very quickly because I have to eat and sleep. And that's honestly the truth. And get home to a, to a newborn, so... Well, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. What an honour to talk about it.